Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast. I'm David Baddiel and in today's episode I'm joined by a brilliant comedian and interviewer turned writer and mindfulness champion. She's here to talk about her latest book, A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled and she's also brought along five objects that relate to her book and her life in all sorts of ways. She's Ruby Wax. Hello Ruby. Hi. How are you doing? I'm fine, David. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm good too. That's a good one. <laughs> no, I like to start with how are you because, you know. Because it's original. It's an original and it's a yeah. way of starting conversation. And you warm but, up the audience. Yeah, and in your case, and to some extent in my case, it's a complicated question. I mean, yeah. people say. Do you really want to know? People say, you know, I'm fine, but you said. We it, don't I'm, say I'm fine. You said I'm, ro- I'm fine ironically, which means obviously. Yeah, means you know, that there's a whole so other not, podcast to yeah. discuss well, this. to be honest with you, I think the question to you, how are you, yeah. is a very good one. Because you basically spent the last, what, 10 years? Not que- well. Not well. And, yeah. and being very public about it and questioning how you can become well. well. I used my disease to make money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, <laughs> what I, else is there to say? Well, so you're doing fine. Thanks. In, in that case. I'm doing fine. So mindfulness, I know a tiny bit about it because... You know, I've seen it in the shops, books yeah. about it. And it's I've, usually right where the dream catchers are. Yeah. And uh, that's where, yeah. Yeah, I've seen that. And, and the I've, Himalayan yak milk. Well, actually, I've... Behind I've, it is the mindfulness. I just came back from the Himalayas. I was, Did you? Yeah, I was in the Himalayas, but not in the kind of boot camp places that... You stayed at a five-star hotel. It was like a five-star hotel that had a spa attached. Is it Ananda? Ananda, yeah. I see. Yeah, yeah, Ananda. I, I Googled it. It's not Ananda, Nananda. It's Ananda, yeah. And I, and do you know what? I spent three days doing Ayurvedic stuff and then like two days doing sort of weird treatments and then I gave up. I cracked and said, bring me curry and bring me like, you know, reflexology. I'm so surprised you did that because yeah. I could have dripped oil on your head too yeah, well, for yeah. half them. I know, that would be lovely if you dripped oil on my head. But I, <laughs> I didn't get into the right headspace while I was there. But sometimes mm. oh. I, I, ha- I do really actually, joking aside, really think that mindfulness and the use of meditation to combat anxiety and depression is a brilliant thing having myself been mentally cli- mentally ill clinically depressed bewildered, as I we would call say it. really clinically depressed for a long time in my 30s and now better to some extent and able to function and all that Well we're and sitting up We're sitting <clears throat> that's up That's a miracle Well that's one thing let's spin back a bit Yeah When did you first become interested or aware of mindfulness Well I a, I hate the word I'm slightly wincing okay. at this moment but okay What word would you prefer There is no word otherwise I would have put it on the cover. Okay. I had a bad bout of the thing yeah. 10 years ago, but then I did. I made a career out of it. I Because Comic Relief, they put a poster up that said, all over the tube station, one in four people have mental illness, one in five people have dandruff. I have both. Right. Okay. Stephen Fry had one too. Right? Mm-hmm. But I thought my picture would be matchbook size because my career was already on the plummet. Mm. And you you know that's how you can tell how famous you are, how big the picture is right, okay. during comic relief. That's worth you can really help yeah. people in the Congo when you're famous, but yeah. then you got nothing. Okay. All so, right. so, you so anyway, a giant little... poster is in all the tube stations all the way down, and I'm mortified. But there's so many I can't cover them, so I decide I'm going to write a show and pretend it's my publicity poster. Okay. So I did it. I wrote it, but I only did it at the Priory, called Live from the Priory, which okay. was audacious, um, yeah. because it was half inmates and half my friends. It was, you know, you imagine a well, lot isn't of Isn't that the same thing? Yeah. yeah. It's pretty much the same thing. Yeah. I would have thought there's a big Venn diagram between those two things, <laughs> really. <laughs> we had them sectioned off. Of uh, course. Cool. Yeah. Don't use the word section no. in this context. <laughs> some people could leave and some people... <laughs> okay, so that's where you started <laughs> yeah, doing... Yeah, then I did it for two years in every national health institution there was. I played everywhere. And the deal was I could stay overnight in the institution. Oh, wow. Because to me, that's home. And okay. then the next day I'd go so to the So none of this day. would have happened if you'd been a member of Bupa. <laughs> that's what you're saying. <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we go to some of the audio book? I enjoy this so much, but I feel we have to go to the audio book. So, uh, yeah, let's hear a bit from the audio book, which I believe you read. We're all frazzled, all of us. Well, most of us. Well, some of my friends are. When I say us, I'm referring to the us in the free world who live relatively scot-free of invasion, hunger, plague, and raining down of frogs. The lucky us, who've won the jackpot by being born in the right place at the right time. And yet we, the winners, complain of stress. Why can't we enjoy the fact that we live to a 100 and still keep our own teeth? We should be popping the champagne cork for the simple reason we're breathing. When I say that we're in a state of emergency, I don't mean the terror, both real and imagined, that lurks about an impending Third World War triggered by anybody from the nut job who runs North Korea 
to the endless other nut jobs in charge of their countries. No, the emergency I'm talking about is that unless we wake soon from our sleepwalking state, we're all on a downhill slide of our own making. In terms of evolution, emotionally anyway, we're heading back to being on all fours. We've sent rockets into space to explore the cosmos, but have, for some reason, neglected to explore ourselves. We just keep trying to achieve and compete with absolutely no insight as to why. We need to set an alarm clock to shake ourselves out of the stupor, to get us out of this mindset where we brood and worry and bring ourselves literally to our senses. That's the only way to experience life, not through words, but through sight, smell, touch, taste, and sound. How many forkfuls of food have you shoved into your mouth today and actually tasted it? I don't know when, historically, we fell asleep at the wheel, because we definitely began our existence awake. As primitive beings, we were awake to the sound of every crackling twig and every twitching bush. Now, however, we just tunnel our way through life on autopilot, as fast as we can, to get our stuff done and neatly put away in drawers. We should be struggling to evolve towards living a peaceful life, not just finishing the next chore on the list, believing that when it's done, then we'll start living. No more postponement. It's getting late in the day. Either we learn how to wake up or we sleepwalk into death. That's the funny part. That was brilliant. Yeah, that's the funny part. Honestly, people are weeping with laughter uh, in the control room. There are (laughs) funny things. No, it's a really funny book. Trust me, I have read books, which I'm going to call self help books. You probably hate that. Yeah. Do you hate that? Okay, Mm. but they never have any jokes in them at all. Mm. I mean, they might have the odd kind of jaunty moment, but they don't have anything that me and you would call a joke. And this has got loads of jokes in it. I wanted to ask you uh, whether you'd brought in any objects for me, because that's something else that happens on this podcast. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, you've got to bring in things to show me. It's part of the. Because it's about you, isn't it? Well, no, they're your objects. I haven't said, please, Ruby, can you bring in that picture of me that you took when I was on your show in 1992? It's all about you. So, what's that? So, this is, I know when we met in 92 that you looked down on me a little bit. Yeah, uh, yeah I quite did. a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so just to prove that, you know, I had some kahunas too, yeah. I went to Oxford wow. and this is my graduation gown. Amazing. I, yeah, there it is. And uh, can you... No, you and can't... it was the happiest day of my life. I wish my parents were alive. Yeah, yeah. I might, I might take them up. Well, uh, just to give up just to show them, show them this, that you've hood. got that. Yeah. yeah. Tell us why you got that. What, what was the, the course you did and, and how did you get it? Well, I left the shores of show business um, and then we have to reinvent. Yeah. There's, a, you know, the season and then yeah. the season's over. So I decided to go and get a degree in psychology. So, right. Uh, and I, it was to be a therapist, but I was never going to be a therapist. I was just interested. And uh, I had to do my hours, you know, where you work as a volunteer in order to be a psychotherapist, so yeah. I did 200 hours. Did you? And uh, yeah, with, and with patience? With patience. Right. Right. And I remember sometimes thinking, oh, come on, just get to the punchline. <laughs> so, yeah. And so I'd, correct, still, I'd correct some of their lines. Right, there's still a spill from being a comedian. Well, yeah. it's in the blood. So yeah, yeah. suddenly you could look into a human brain and watch what happens when it thinks. So you're, from, the, from the get-go, you were interested in Always psychology it. from a kind of neurological perspective. Always, but you, it wasn't possible. So now we're in the decade of the brain. They have equipment. So I researched which psychological technique, whatever, would have the greatest influence on dealing with stress without running to a shrink and say, fix me. And the only reason I went to get my degree in therapy was to see who's a shyster and who isn't. I really wanted to know what I was paying for. Right. So So, I do know what a good therapist is now. So then when I did the research, cognitive and mindfulness had the best results as far as looking in a brain scanner and seeing that you can actually get your stress levels down. Who knew? I thought, let's take everything I'm interested in, which is how the mind works. Where does it work? How can we have those thoughts? I could have, I shouldn't, I didn't. Is it just me? Am I a freak? All I ever want to do is know how did this happen? Mm. You know, wh- mm. how, what merchandise is on my head? It's like we have a Ferrari on our head, but mm. nobody gave us the keys. Yeah. So I, um, after I researched it, I found the guy who um, created mindfulness-based therapy, a professor at Oxford, and I said, don't give me the fluffy stuff. Cut the angel wings. Mm. Just tell me what happens in the brain. I only have two minutes. <laughs> Go. So he said, well, if you really want to know, you'd have to get into Oxford and get your master's. Okay. So then I said to them at Oxford, if you don't let me in, I'm studying this anyway. Okay. Anyway, they 
they fit. And I went there and got my master's in mindfulness-based cognitive therapy. Okay, well, let's hear again from the audiobook of A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled. In this extract, you give your own definition of mindfulness. Before I start, I'd like to give you my personal list of what I think mindfulness isn't. One, learning to be nice to people. Two, saying hello to your dishes before you wash them or learning to love your soap before you wash with it. Three, standing naked in the rain and smiling inanely. Four, moving in slow motion so that everyone behind you gets into a pileup. Five, becoming nothingness while sitting in your underwear. Six, seeing God and or Santa. Seven, a one-way ticket to Nirvana or Burning Man. Same thing. Eight, leaving your old skin behind and becoming a part of everything, only thinner. What it is. Mindfulness is a way of exercising your ability to pay attention. When you can bring focus on something, the critical thoughts quiet down. We're told, especially as children, to pay attention, but we have no instructions on how exactly to go about it. Go on, train your attention on something or someone, and try to keep it there. You might for a few seconds, but after that it'll flit away to the next thing like a butterfly on heat. You probably won't even notice that you're focusing now on something else because you weren't paying attention in the first place. And it's not being able to pay attention to something outside, but about being able to focus inside, being able to stand back and watch your thoughts without the usual commentary on them. As with any skill that has to be developed, you have to practice. It isn't part of the human package. My definition of mindfulness is noticing your thoughts and feelings without kicking your own ass while you're doing it. I was in therapy for a long time, in psychodynamic therapy. You trained to be a therapist. You obviously know an awful lot because you talked about wanting to understand your, yourself and wanting to understand people about you know the work you might do if you were to approach mental health in that way, i.e. I'm going to unearth all the stuff that damaged me and I'm going to talk it through yeah. and I'm going to find... Now, mindfulness is yeah. not about that no it's about saying that none of that stuff that stuff has just been done well and it's, it's causing these thoughts so let's not worry about the cause let's just find a way of making those thoughts not damaging yeah oh <laughs> that was a dalai lama i think calling to say now that's wrong david yeah God, should got i quite shut wrong. this off or <laughs> yeah. can i take calls while you're talking <laughs> well you, i don't think that's very mindful of you to be honest <laughs> no but i multitask <laughs> you're supposed to be with... giving your attention to me no, and then I, I fall in love with you but that's yeah. just how much attention is that i'm sorry i scattered <laughs> that's okay but that's my point is that you're, you're not you know, someone who's interested at least uh, in this point in your life in that kind of let's go into the past and talk about well, it f- first of all a lot of people can't put together a narrative it's all scattered obviously they can't put their life story together. So it's really important to talk it out, get an idea. But science has moved on. You're never going to be able to recreate the memory. Every time you bring back a thought, it's a photocopy of a photocopy. But it's important for people to feel there is a united self. Okay, so talking therapy is important. The problem is, is, and therapists want you to go on and on and on. There's no end to it till the bank accounts yeah. close. But there is a yeah. place for therapy. But if you repeat, and again, this is looking in a brain scanner, if you repeat a concept over and over again, this happened, this happened, it's her fault, it's her fault. Yeah. I'm a loser. I'm a victim. I'm whatever. Those neurons get really hardwired, and so that's who you become. So you determine your own fate, and you're stuck in it. And the point of cognitive or whatever is to see the areas you're stuck and releasing yourself from the kind of bondage. Mm. We haven't got name tags. This brain is more complex than all the universe is put together. Let's talk about the fact that your book actually includes a six-week course. So I wrote the six-week course right. with Mark Williams Blessing, who wrote the real book, okay. who created it, because people don't have time to sit around training for 20 minutes. So this is something you can do. It's an exercise of the brain. So it's there's no muscle, but the exercise, the point of it is to be able to throw your focus to where you want your focus to be, rather yeah. than being pulled by distraction. And we live in a world of distraction. Yeah, I need to know how to navigate it. So in order to do these exercises, there's times, believe it or not, where you don't have anything to do. Like standing in a queue, yeah. there's nothing to do. Yeah. There's seconds where nothing's going on. At that moment, you can just, you know, do the exercise. I always say you can't get a six-pack with one sit-up. Mm. If you just do this, you know, there's horror going on and you suddenly try to do this, forget it. you got to get the parachute ready. So the simple exercise of 
All right. Anytime you focus on a sense, let's say you watch your thoughts, they're all over the place, but you learn while you're watching them, if you pull your focus to a sense, and it could be drinking your coffee, it could be tracking your breathing, some people like that, it could be just feeling your bum on the chair. If you send your focus there, immediately, if you look in a scanner, the cortisol comes down. The cortisol is the thoughts. There's no difference, okay, when you're going, I can't do it, everybody hates me. That's cortisol. So for that second, it comes down. Hmm. Then, because we're human, it goes back up again. So you pull it down. This is a sit-up. It pulls you up again. And you also learn when it does not to beat yourself up because that's when you get stressed about stress. Like, I should be concentrating. I'm not doing this right. Mindfulness isn't going blank. It's just watching with the way a therapist Uh, contains you and takes your crap. Mm. So now you're just watching it. You're bringing it back. It goes up again. Each time this part called the insula gets more and more buff, Mm. which means, again, your ability to throw focus and bring down the constant barrage of those thoughts. It doesn't go away, but it's more like a radio in another room. So to some extent, isn't it? It's about the brain being unable to focus on the other stuff when you say, no, you're just going to focus on the breath in your nose. The brain brain can't. The brain actually, despite its complexity, kind of can't multitask. It can't multitask. But if I do my little exercise, drink the coffee Mm. for two minutes, focus taste, watch it go. Focus on taste, watch Mm. it go. Maybe on the way here, I'm in the taxi. I can feel by the time I get to you, I'm not thinking, how many more emails do I have to write? I'll do it when we're done. Mm. But I think I can throw my focus on you pretty well. And I couldn't have in the past. Okay, it's got to be time for your next object. Bring out the bag. Yeah, bring out the bag. What's in the bag? So, what is in the bag? I don't know. This is just a surprise. (laughs) Okay. Okay. What's that? Moisturizer. Oh, perfect. Do I need it? (laughs) You know, you've been doing your attention on me. You've been thinking flaky skin. Flaky skin. Get rid of the beard. Who knows what's going on? That's the trouble with too much attention on my nose. That's the kind of thing you're going to (laughs) notice. No, why and the you, word what? Jewish is suddenly going to come out yeah, of my mouth, like Tourette's. Yeah, but what is that doing the prairie here? Oh, that's very expensive, isn't it? the most expensive thing you can get. But people say, Ruby, you look 25. <laughs> yeah. That's not funny. No, I laughed too much. I shouldn't have done it. Why I, did you do that? Uh, only because I thought it's a joke and then I thought, well... No, it's I, not. No, okay, sorry. Okay. <laughs> people say, Ruby, you look 25. Okay. And that'll be because of the La Prairie. Oh, I see. Yeah. Have you, are you doing it like a product placement bit or is this to do with mindfulness? Because are you Moisturizer saying... Moisturizer and mindfulness is my next book. <laughs> are you saying that if you become properly mindful, you won't have any need of things like La Prairie Moisturizer? Again, this is like we're everything. We're vain. We're arrogant. We're narcissists. We're psychopaths. We're pornographic. We're adorable. Mm. So, yeah, part of me wants to look in the mirror and not see age. Mm. It's just the way it is. Mm. I'm not suddenly free from that. Right. And I find it upsetting that I am older. Mm. But rather than believing these thoughts, I mean, it's true, I am, and they could drag me down really into the darkness. Mm. Sometimes, you know, just if I spend a few minutes doing that exercise, you go, okay, these are the thoughts. Now, I had the thoughts when I was 20. I ended up in an institution when I was 30. So clearly there have been some negative thoughts going around then too. Mm. This isn't any worse. Mm. As a matter of fact, it's much better now because I'm not in an institution and I'm not being besieged by the thoughts. Mm. Don't think they're not coming in, yeah. but they're not killing me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, let's just dip back in and hear a tiny bit more from the audiobook. It's that old chestnut comparison that drives us mad. Some people are satisfied with their lot. I know they're out there in the country somewhere, among the trees, growing their own chickens, pulling udders for a living, and sitting around the fire roasting marshmallows. As for the rest of us, we're assaulted by messages from the ether about what we don't have but should have if we want to be cool. It's no longer just about keeping up with your neighbor, but about leaving that neighbor in the dust, seething with resentment. Comparison goes way back. Why isn't my cave dress as nice as Fran's? Why don't I have a bigger cod piece? It's always the same. Why, why, why? And that's what makes us stressed. We strive, we strive, and we strive some more. It's always been the way. We suffer from conceits and illusions that tear us apart. We're like hungry ghosts, always seeking, wanting, yearning for something. Soon there will be epitaphs that read, She died of envy. He croaked because his car was too small. The title of my theme song is Never Good Enough. When I'm with the highly brainy, I turn into my 13-year-old moron self. 
I'm suddenly in the back of the class, useless and gormless, with my protruding teeth. The longer I'm with these people, the less able I am to articulate anything, which makes me feel that I'm even lower down the ladder of intelligence. I usually try to keep them talking so they don't find out that I know nothing. That was Ruby Wax reading from her book, A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled, and talking about something that does bother me, which is that I should have a bigger cod piece. Uh, so, Ruby, one thing I think that has made this worse that you're talking about now, which is the need to compare yourself to everyone else in the universe, is we sort of can do that now. Like before, yeah. there were only seven people in our universe, and if you know one of them had a bigger cod piece, that was what you had to worry about. But now... Every person on the globe. Everybody's and, and, got a bigger cod piece. Everyone's got a bigger cod piece and everyone's life is out there to say yeah. a lot of the time, my life is better than yours and here here's the Instagram pictures to prove yeah. it. So you spend your airtime like bucking yourself up to say, you know, I'm the alpha. Now, you know, you're not good enough. Yeah. You have to be this. You have to be. Or at least it infers it. And advertising companies know how to infer it. No, totally. That's yeah, because I mean, then you're aroused and you think, what do I need to do? What do I need to do? Which is the great thing about the human race, but also our downfall. But you, I think in the book you also talk about you know, the, the limbic system, whatever it is. Uh, I, I am, of course, not a neurologist, but the, the amygdala and all that stuff in your head is designed to cope with a woolly mammoth coming mm -hmm. through the door and the various cortisol things that will kick in. Yeah, when you happens. need it. It's yeah, your you life, it. life preserver. Yeah, yeah, but now that is essentially, you know, reading someone's tweet that makes you feel bad will well, kick when, in that system. Yeah, when you told me how many tweets you had, I got a hit of adrenaline. Okay. Just as if a predator came in. But I could do something about him. I could run or I could try to kill him. Mm. But with your thing, what can I do? So I'm helpless. So now if I wasn't doing what I do, that would stay with me for probably a few days. And then I'd take it out on somebody else, forgetting that it started in here. Okay. At least I know it. And that's comedy to understand and then deal with it. Yeah. Have you got another object to show me? I'm not going to really hold it up a lot. But I have a, a little bit of an OCD thing. I have to wear red underpants. Oh, really? Always? Always. Why? Because I think something bad will happen if I don't. So oh, these really? are some pants. Is that a Jewish thing? No, do, I wonder if it might be because... Do uh, Jews wear red underpants? No. Let's not, ask our readers. It's not the underpants. It's the thinking something bad will happen <laughs> part of it. So a, anything you might do, like I have on now... Yeah, uh, a, a really, rubber band. No, no, it's a thing I got in the Himalayas. I, yeah. I went to some Hindu temple and, yeah. and on top of a mountain and they gave me what is now a very ragged piece of string. Oh, and wait till it really falls off. Yeah, and, and, yeah. and I am He's a, laughing. I'm a fundamentalist atheist yeah. um, and I therefore should not have any truck with the idea that this protects me in any I, way. I wouldn't let it go either. Yeah, no, I can't. I find it difficult to let it go. You get, I, it's juju, isn't it? it? Well, that's what this is. Yeah. <laughs> that's two of us. <laughs> so, but I think uh, that there might be something there. But why, with all the work you've done on yourself, do you feel like if I don't wear red underpants, something bad will happen? Maybe because when I did really good things, maybe on stage, I was wearing red underpants. Right. And then I'd just do it for the shows. And now I think, well, you know, so now they're all red underpants. Can I ask you a question which may seem like a... a, a <laughs> a, a, a sexual question. I'm sorry, it is a sexual question. Do you wear a red bra as well? No. It, no, okay. No, that can change. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. I, I think something bad might happen unless you do. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> no, now really. I know where I'm going after this podcast. <laughs> but sometimes you do. Okay, let's leave it there. I don't take it off, though, until uh, it falls off. Oh, uh, okay, the bra. <laughs> <laughs> really? wow. Yeah, they said God. wear it out. Because at the end of your book, you go to Wales for um, eight days, is it? Yeah. Is it eight days of seven-hour um, meditation days. Yeah. And you were, and silence. And silence yeah. and eating like virtually nothing. And no, no, you do eat. Oh, you do eat? Yeah, of course. It sounded like you were just eating digestive biscuits. No, no, what happened was they gave me a brain scan before I went in, mm. and then you go into a silent retreat. It is Iron Man. It's war. Mm. Your brain wants to do stuff real bad, mm. and you're reaching for phones that don't exist. And, you know, you really hear the voices loudly, loudly, loudly. That's all you hear. What an idiot. Why can't you? And eventually, it's like if you were arm wrestling, your brain starts to give up. It's exhausted. So you start to actually taste the food, and the food becomes delicious. Yeah, that was the bit that made me want to go. Oh, my is God. Is your description of a digestive biscuit I fell in love made with a digestive biscuit. <laughs> and then there was another day, because you don't have to talk yeah, to potato. anybody. You talk about a potato. I ran into the kitchen, I broke the silence, and I said, it's how like did you guys make this potato? Yeah. And the guy said, I made it with a potato. <laughs> you know what I did? I didn't even eat the whole digestive. I saved it. I wrapped it in a napkin so I could just have a few crumbs at a time. Literally, my eyes would roll back in my head because you're focused now. 
So that's not from because I assumed. I got, oh, no, that, you I, eat. I got that it was from Focus, but yeah. I also thought, oh, maybe they're not eating very much. Oh, no, you, so, like, the tiniest no. bit of food is delicious. No, no, no. You, you're you eating. It's just now you're tasting it. Okay. Yeah. When you read the book, one thing that happens when you get to the end is that you are cheering you on at that place mm. because you get the sense, like, Ruby's, like, our person in the world of mindfulness and in the world of, you know, retreats and meditation and blah, blah. And you think like, go on, Ruby, you can do it. <laughs> and by the end of it, you are so pleased that you make it through. Yeah. It's, I really love that last bit. And I, it did make me want to go, although I don't think I would have left. No, it's not for, and mindfulness isn't for everybody. No, well, I, I, yeah. I like Or jogging isn't for everybody. No, but I, know, I, think, I think mindfulness is, would be very good for me. And I do, in fact, try it from time to time. Yeah, but, that's and, not it then. That's not it? Well, if you, as I yeah, said, if you it. went to a gym and lifted a thing, would you say it's a workout? It's, it's the repetition. Right. Okay. But I'm thinking of like what you said earlier about you're on the toilet, you're in a queue. Yeah, but do then there. do, yeah, but every day. Okay. You know. I don't do anything every day except no, masturbate. No. Okay. Well, when um, you're doing it, yeah. the thing is take your focus and put it into not just the overwhelming thing, but in your hand, what, what's it feel like holding it? Okay. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it's difficult with sex because you're going to be flooded with a hormone. Yeah. So it's not, I wouldn't actually Some of the women I've that, haven't, haven't been in the moment. As I said, it doesn't have to be the same thing. But if you're not doing anything and you're in an office and you realize your head is going into a red mist, if your computer starts, you know, burning, you turn it off and reboot. So again, if you could just, and they do it at Google, a buzzer does go off and either feel the sense of your feet they, on the they ground. They do mindfulness at Google. Totally. A buzzer goes off and they all do mindfulness. They're taught, they have classes that at a certain point and then they don't have the buzzers, they just realize they're overloaded, is if you just focus on the weight of your body on the chair, just send it down there. For a few minutes, your brain will go away. It has to. It'll come back. And then at Google, they go back to work and their productivity is way off the wow. chart. I'm amazed to discover that Google actually unplugs its staff and boots them up it again. It unplugs its staff. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. And that, look, there's going to be people who hate it. There's other you know, geeks who won't be able to stand it. But in every campus of Google, they're doing this. Wow. Yeah. Um, shall we have the next bit? Let's have the next bit. I can't read. I'm not funny. I can't really speak, get up, or go for a walk. But this time, I'm not fearful about having depression, having studied it. I know this is what it is. Nor am I ashamed, feeling that I'm making this up and could snap out of it. Fear is a symptom of the disease. I feel like I'm in full emergency mode because chemicals have started to flood my brain and cause havoc. You can't think your way out of this disease. It has you. You don't have it. I have to keep telling myself that this is not my fault that there is no difference between the mental and the physical. It's a reality that our brain and body are symbiotically interconnected. This is why there's such a stigma about mental illness. It's not taken seriously. But imagine if I reacted to someone telling me that they had lupus, the disease everybody has every week on house, by saying, oh, well, that's only physical. Snap out of it. I did force myself to go for a walk yesterday, and it felt as if with every step I would fall through the earth. I tried to be like a good mother. I kept saying to myself how well I was doing, that even to be outside was a triumph. So I'm still scared, but not scared that I'm losing my mind because I know this is depression, and these are the traits that come with it. I know this monster. I've studied it, and I know how deep its roots are in me, leeching my energy out of me. I know all this, and yet the anthem of all depressives plays in my mind, repeating, how long will this last? How long will this last? It's hard for me to write this and come up with words and sentences, because it feels like there's no one at the wheel of the ship. I'm pushing myself to keep going so I can remember what it feels like, and so that everyone else who suffers with this knows to be able to say, this is not my imagination, I am not being self-indulgent. The book talks a lot about how to help people who are, who are reading it, but then every so often there are interjections from your own life uh, and quite often from periods in your own life when you've been really hit badly by depression and that particular bit was really bad. Uh, and your most recent episode, I think, as that, well. That was uh, two years ago, yeah. Yeah, that's your most recent bad episode. In 10 years, yeah. Right. <clears throat> one, one thing I wanted to ask about it, which I think, I mean, as someone who's depressed, has been depressed, this might seem a strange question, but I think it's worth asking for people who aren't, which is it follows on from a description of a US tour and a Norway tour 
which is really bloody depressing. I mean, <laughs> there's no question if all that is true that your real objective life out there was awful. It was bad. Uh, during that time. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, sometimes, and I've been like this, you're depressed and essentially there is no real outside that, issue this there. Is true. There was outside issue. Yeah. Yeah. That was a strange one. Yeah. It was bad, but. Somebody with resilience or somebody with the gene not for depression mm. would, you know, they can take it more than we can. Right. You know, it's like we have a thin bit of paper between panic and depression. It, it was the full Monty. Because I hadn't had it for 10 years. Bully for me. I'm going to have it tomorrow and then I'm going to hunt you down. Yeah, okay. So I hadn't no, had you'll it for be in 10 bed. years. I'll, I'll be fine. You won't get out of bed. <laughs> Uh, I, I hadn't had it for 10 years, and then because they sent me on this book tour, and it was horrifying, I, I did start to slip into depression. So uh, it did deliver what it says on the package, which is there's no cure for this stuff. But I could hear it earlier. So I already knew it was starting to happen. You could just hear the whispers. That means that when I got back from Norway, I, check, I checked out. So here's, here's Whereas, a very important before question. Before I get real busy. Here's a really important question. When you had that episode... Were you able to use your mindfulness techniques? Well, I could techniques write about it. To, and so this, this was written in the moment. This was well. The only reason the depression is in it, I'm writing the book. There's a deadline. This happens to me in the heat of depression. You can't even lift a pen. Mm. So the fact that there was a little bit of distance, you know, and I could w observe the disease rather than be eaten by it, mm. is already unbelievable. Mm. So I'm, I'm writing. It's white hot. Mm. I have called Penguin and said, "You're not getting this book." Mm. And I could only be honest and write about it. But if in the old days, I would have gone on when I was better. There's something I, I probably should make clear to anyone who doesn't know what depression is, uh, which is that depression is not, I, I, this has been said before, but perhaps it needs to be just said quickly, not being sad. Depression <laughs> is, in my experience, a physical illness. It is um, a physical illness. I mean, there's all sorts of thoughts that go with it, but the key thing that makes you ill is uh, an extraordinarily uh, awful sort of series of physical symptoms that are kind of at once extremely weighing down, at the same time extremely electric, because the, the anxiety makes you feel incredibly jumpy and and able to settle at the same time, mm. is what I found. Yes, yeah, somebody said thoughts, which are the illness, thoughts to depression are what a tumor is to cancer. Mm. You're not making up thoughts. You know, when you have certain chemicals going through, the thoughts are just agitated. Mm. They're the symptom. They're not just going, oh, come on, get out of bed. They're killing you. Mm. We have got time for another object. We've got time for another object. Oh, two more objects. Okay, oh my two God. more objects. How long is this going on for? <laughs> two more objects. Oh, well, I brought in 140. Oh, let's see them all. I want to well, see Which them all. one do you want? Do you want a funny one or do you want to funny. check this out? Funny. Okay. I mean, you can check this out as well. You can bring them both out at once. If no, you want. no. Can I bring both objects out? Yeah, okay, let's do it's that. a duo. It's let's... a twofer. Okay. So here they are. Here they are. Which one do you want first? All right, uh, they're I can both see up. a pig. I can see a pig. Oh, <laughs> well. So one's a pig and one's a picture of your <laughs> OB. <laughs> 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 so, you can't, I, this sums up my life. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. There's nothing else to say. Yeah, so yeah. what seems to be happening here, from my point of view, <laughs> is the pig is saying to me, you don't have one of these. That's what it's saying. Yeah. The pig is saying, you, Screw you. Jew, yeah. you boy, yeah. yeah. You I'm, can't eat me, <laughs> yeah. and now you can't have this. <laughs> yeah. Do you just, see? Here's a whole load of things you can't have and don't you, own. I bet this is going to take you weeks to get over. <laughs> I, I'm going to be in bed and cursing you <laughs> from tomorrow. So you've got an OBE. That looks great. What uh, about the pig? He wants attention. What's the pig? What is the pig? Well, which one do you want to know about? Uh, well, I, let's start with the pig because the OBE is going to cause me some trouble. So let's yeah. start with the pig. This is my <laughs> fuck you about the 50, 100,000 tweets, okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's a fabulously interesting uh, medal as well. Uh, do you wear it a lot? Like in with bed. A, You know what? It matches the red underwear. That's the idea. <laughs> they knew that. So um, the pig. So the pig, I don't know. I never collected things. You know, people always say, what means a lot? I don't have art. I don't have expensive jewelry. When I saw this pig, mm. it was a circus, okay, and it was in a pile. <clears throat> and I saw, if you're depressed, <clears throat> this will always. It's always it, It's funny. a winner. It is a winner. So I, it's got then, a very <clears throat> proper honk. But then like a proper loud honk. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I saw this, and then I couldn't stop buying one, so I started buying in bulk. So now pretty much my house is drowning in pigs. Really? Drowning yeah. in pigs. And there's a shop in where I get in in Cape Town where I run in hysterical sweating going, have you got any pink pigs? Because I don't like the yellow one. <laughs> and they say it's her again. <laughs> so I have so many of these. I looked it up. How can I buy some more? And okay. it turns out you can only buy them in China in bulk of okay. 50,000. What you need to know, uh, listeners, okay, is that the, the, the author of this book about mental health <laughs> is fine. She's really fine. But... <laughs> 
That's a mindful curve. So that, that's... That's the peg. That's all your objects. Now, We've the done OBE... All your objects. Oh, the OBE. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get the OBE for the yeah. mindfulness shtick or for the comedy? Or oh, both? not for the comedy. I got right. it for my contribution to mental health. Oh, that's health. fine. No, I'm fine now. And, and, and go, comedy. Go on about it. And comedy. Oh, and comedy. Oh, damn. No, I, and I'm not allowed to get it from the so Queen because I'm America. From? So who gave it to you? Donald Trump? Yeah. Donald flew over. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That would kill you. He must it? love your pigs. He threw me out of an airplane when I interviewed him. Oh, is there an interview with 20 him? 20 years ago on YouTube. Oh, I wow. interviewed him and we were 33,000 feet in his plane. And he told me he wanted to be president in the United States someday. And I laughed and okay. he landed the plane. Really? And threw my crew out. It's your fault. That's what you're saying. I'm, it's your fault. He's trying to prove it to you. That's it. That's what's happening. Thanks. Why did you have to twist that around? Because <laughs> that's how my brain anyway, works. Anyway, back to the OBE. <laughs> yeah, okay. So I, who gave it to you? Who? Okay, the Lord Luff Lieutenant. Here's the thing. When you're American, you can have it where you feel comfortable. You know, you can be presented. So I chose the Priory. Oh, right, okay. Because that's where I'm comfortable. So <laughs> he came and there was a big thing about, like, can you bring a sword into the Priory? <laughs> Seriously. Really? Yeah, they, we had to, like, go to the top. Oh, my God. Because of the gutters. Yeah, because so, of... Um, so there we can't were. Can't bring any shops into the priory. Well, he was there. Okay. They, yeah, and we had the uh, cut out of the queen. Yeah, all right. There were inmates going true? in and out. This is true, what you're telling me. I yeah. have pictures. You okay. want to see it? No, it's okay. I believe okay, you. Okay, pictures of my right. OB in the priory. We had big balloons. There was no alcohol. Okay. There were finger <laughs> foods. <laughs> and um, we were in where they usually have, um, you know... Some I don't them. actually know. I've not actually oh, ever okay. been in the it's, priory. It's I know a, it's a surprise. Yeah, it's got a smell that I adore. Okay. So we did that. What's that, then... lithium? <laughs> <laughs> oh, de yeah. And Derek, who teaches salsa, he came and taught everybody salsa, like when really? I was there, which is hilarious. So you because... can choreograph your own OBE ceremony if you're American, yeah. basically. Yeah, you can say where you want it. Wow. I am American and, yeah, but and British. You didn't get one, did you? No, I didn't get one. You yeah. have to mention that. I was just going to do on you a whole flight of fancy about you what tell my me how OB's many tweets everywhere. you get. You're going to get it now. Okay, yeah. follow It's us. going to keep on flying in. <laughs> okay. In the old days, I wouldn't have realized this and I would have just gone passive aggressive. Okay. But now I know why I'm angry. Okay, that's good. So yeah. you can. Ce- it's just, so we can laugh about <laughs> we it. We can celebrate it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's have a final extract from the audiobook, uh, A Mindfulness Guide for the Frazzled. The next time we evolve, it won't be at the whim of natural selection. It will be by our selection. And it will be a matter of consciously developing our emotional insight rather than inventing some other thing that might be technologically jaw-dropping but won't make our lives any easier or happier. We have enough smarts, now we need more hearts. I've noticed that when people are extremely successful, they start to believe they're invincible. They're so busy being smart that they forget... They're just a piece of meat with a cell by date. They don't even have a flicker of awareness about their own mortality. They forget that they, too, are biodegradable and must be handled with care, or they can kiss themselves bye-bye. If we don't develop our more human qualities, then we're doomed, evolution-wise, to become cyborgs. Our cells will be replaced by silicone chips, steel pincers for fingers, but hundreds of them so we can multitask really well. And then we'll be perfect, no flaws. Only a shiny silver carcass with an imprint of an apple where our hearts used to be. <laughs> that bit is funny, but very, very bleak. <laughs> One of the things I think is really fascinating about what you've done with this whole thing is I probably, even though I knew you were nuts <laughs> when I first met you, yeah. uh, I, I probably would not have pegged you as someone who would go for this because... As you say in the book, mindfulness is about being compassionate to yourself. And you were always and still are like the most unbelievably kind of self-deprecating, like having a go at yourself, finding every single bad thing you could possibly think of Mm. for yourself and putting that out there as a comedian. So you're like really cruel to yourself as a comedian. Well, except now my comedy, you know, I'm going on tour doing Frazzled. I don't really do that. You know what I mean? I don't do that. Look how fat I am. I never liked that. But, you know, if you said... Uh, you know, I got an OB, he's my opener, my show's over. Right. So, uh, you, you know, funny is going, you know what happened to me. But funny isn't what a lot of comedians do, especially women, saying nobody dates me, I'm a dog. Mm-hmm. That ain't happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I think is brilliant about it is you found a way of 
keeping that funny because I think funny needs to be hard a lot of the time. Yeah, it but needs it to be, doesn't, it doesn't have, want to be. You don't have to attack yourself. No, you don't have to attack yourself. And actually, I, I, I in my own the comedy that I do now, I try not to attack any other kind of named individuals. Yeah, I basically, just try and you know find the funny in the world as it presents itself to me without like attack. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that you can still have a proper muscular, you know, really hard edged type of comedy without losing compassion. And I think that's an amazing space to be in. Yeah. Again, the C word is difficult for me too, but uh, kind of... um, Compassion you're talking about there. Pull the anger back, you know, then be funny. Yeah. Or bitter. And a lot of, you know, you can see the... But but all that stuff... That is compassion. Yeah. But but you can be be angry and you can be bitter. But if you're eaten by it, it shows. People say, do you have to be crazy to be a comedian or whatever and I go first of all it's one in four people have depression they're not that many comedians Mm. okay so it's like with me now if I was being passive aggressive you'd sense it and the audience would sense it I think if your heart is open and Mm. you're really pleased you know just to be alive Mm. or whatever and then you know you've got good lines so you're a conductor in front of an orchestra rather than spewing your rage it's better comedy I'm going to stop it there thank you so much Ruby Wax (laughs) thank you There are untapped sources of meaning all around us, right here, right now. Drawing on the latest research in positive psychology, Emily S. Fahani smith identifies four pillars upon which meaning rests. Belonging, purpose, storytelling and transcendence. Inspiring and full of contemporary examples, the power of meaning will strike a profound chord in anyone seeking a richer, more satisfying life. On Thursday and Sunday evenings, a group of seekers gathered in a large room of my family's home in downtown Montreal, where my parents ran a Sufi meeting house. Sufism is the school of mysticism associated with Islam, and my family belonged to the Nima Tulahi Sufi order, which originated in Iran in the 14th century and today has meeting houses all over the world. Twice a week, darvishes, or members of the order, would sit on the floor and meditate for several hours. With their eyes closed and their chins to their chests, they silently repeated a name or attribute of God as traditional Iranian Sufi music played. Living in the Sufi meeting house as a child was enchanting. The walls of our home were decorated with sculptures of Arabic script that my father carved from wood. Tea was brewing constantly, perfuming the air with the fragrance of bergamot. After meditating, the Sufis drank the tea, which my mother served along with dates or Iranian sweets made with rose water, saffron, cardamom, and honey. Sometimes I served the tea, carefully balancing a tray full of glasses, saucers, and sugar cubes as I knelt down before each darvish. The darvishes loved dipping a sugar cube in their tea, putting it in their mouths, and drinking their tea through the sugar. They loved singing the poetry of medieval Sufi sages and saints. There was Rumi. Ever since I was sliced away from my home of reeds, each note I whisper would make most any heart weep. And there was Attar. Since love, he writes of the seeker, has spoken in your soul, reject the self, that whirlpool where our lives are wrecked. They loved, too, sitting in silence, being together, and remembering God through quiet contemplation. Darvishes called Sufism the path of love. Those on the path are on a journey toward God, the beloved, which calls them to renounce the self and to constantly remember and love God at every turn. To Sufis, loving and adoring God means loving and adoring all of creation and every human being that is a part of it. Mohabbat, or loving kindness, is central to their practice. When we first moved into our new home in Montreal, Sufis from all over North America came and stayed for days to help my parents convert the brownstone, formerly a legal office, into a space fit for majlis, the name of the bi-weekly gathering for meditation. When a homeless man knocked on our door one evening looking for a meal and a place to sleep, he was welcomed in. And when my father complimented a darvish on a scarf he was wearing, the darvish gave it with pleasure as a gift to my dad. After that, my family had a general understanding that you only complimented another darvish's possessions with great caution. The Power of Meaning by Emily Asfahani-Smith Read by Mozan Mano Available now to download and keep 
on Audible and iTunes.